Good evening. My name is Tom Giro, and I'm on the board of directors for the Forest History Association of Wisconsin. Um, we're going to have a webinar tonight. It's going to be fascinating. You'll hear about that in a minute or two. But first, I wanted to do some shameless promotion of our organization. So you see our mission up on the screen here. It's to inform, educate, archive, and uh, publish. And so that's a little bit about us. Uh, we work really hard at this. We have our archives located in Stevens Point at the university. And so it's relatively uh, inexpensive to become a member of the Forest History Association of Wisconsin. It's only $20. And uh, the webinars uh, in line with our educate and inform are free. So you don't have to pay for them, but if you support this work, we would appreciate you becoming a member. Uh, so before we get to our webinar, we had two things we wanted to talk about. Uh, next week, let me get my slides moving here. Uh, next week, there will be a related webinar given by David Greeno uh, the Menominee, about the Menominee Treaties. So these two webinars are designed to go together and you can see the link there. And I also already put a link in the uh, chat button for you so that you can go to it and uh, register for next week's webinar. And then also, we have our fall conference at Casina. Casina, all of this is related to uh, the Menominee story. And I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Don Snitzler just to talk a little bit about the fall conference. Well, the fall conference starts uh, a month from today. Uh, it's uh, date is October 11th. Uh, the day prior to that, Thursday, October 10th, we'll have a board meeting and an informal get together but the conference itself is really scheduled for October 11th and 12th. And it includes a series of lectures. Uh, on Friday, we'll have about, um, on Friday, we have the tours. And then on Saturday, we have the lectures. And uh, there's a, a, a good uh, assemblage of speakers talking about a variety of different uh, things related to the Menominee tribal uh, history and the Menominee tribal enterprises and the forestry that they do uh, in Mer um, Menominee County. Uh, deadline for registration is September 27th, so you still have time if you're interested in uh, signing up to attend the conference. You can find more information about it on the Forest History Association website. The address is down below on this screen here. It says forcedhistoryassociation.com. And underneath the events heading, uh, you'll find information, uh, full details about the conference. And then under publications, if you want to, you can also see what we have provided in our newsletter, Chips and Sawdust. And both of those would be on that website. Uh, registrations are still coming in, so you're not too late. I would hope that if you're interested in this subject tonight or in learning more about the Menominee County, Menominee Tribal Enterprises, and forestry in Menominee, uh, that you join us in Kashina on October 11th and 12th. Okay, Tom, um, you want to get ready? Okay, very good. Tonight, um, I, it's my uh, my privilege to introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, we have Dr. Carol Cornelius with us. She is um, a member of the Oneida, Stockbridge, Muncie, and Muntauk Turtle Clan. Er she earned her PhD degree in cross-cultural curriculum and American Indi Indian history from Cornell University. She's taught at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay where she helped build the First Nations study undergraduate program and at the at, and at the College of the Menominee Nation. Uh, tonight she's going to be giving us a presentation on entitled uh, the Menominee, I'm just trying to find my notes here, <laughs> entitled the removal of New York Indians to Menominee lands. Treaties made up in the 1800s between the United States and the indigenous nation of what is now Wisconsin had a profound influence on the region's cultural and political landscape. 
Yet few people realize that the early part of the century, the Menominee and Ho-Chunk nations of Wisconsin signed land treaties with several indigenous nations from New York State. In this groundbreaking book, uh, Carol Cornelius has compiled a careful account of these nation-to-nation -nation treaties in large part in the words of the indigenous leaders who served as the voices and representatives of their nation. Um, to make tonight's webinar work simple or, or successful, uh, we're going to ask you to pose your questions in the chat feature. Uh, it's usually located at the bottom of your screen. Just take the chat or type into the chat and we will hold those questions until the end of the presentation. Mm -hmm. At the end of the presentation, either Tom or I will relay those questions to Dr. Cornelius. If you're new to Zoom and you have problems with the Zoom feature tonight, if you can find the chat feature, you can use that same chat feature to reach out to Tom and I, and we will try to correct any problems that might arise. So without further ado, let me turn this over to Dr. Cornelius. I know we're all anxious to hear her talk. So Carol. Yeah, I won't go. Sigoli Swagwek, Wagadun Hahe. Greetings to all of you, and I'm really happy that you're here and that we'll get to spend this time together. Ganika no lu ni yungwats. At noa ni wagit da loda. Onyo de ag ne hoda na shoni. O kale mahikanu, o kale manta. In the Oneida language, my name is Ganika no lu, and it means a um, little bit of water, or water is precious. I'm also Mahikanu, who became known as the Stockbridge. And Ma the Montauk were a nation on the farthest east end of Long Island. And in the 1700s, there were seven nations along the east coast and Long Island that were so decimated by disease and war that they joined together and became the Brother Town. So the Oneida and the Stockbridge and the Brother Town moved to Wisconsin. And the Montauk was one of those nations. My book is called A History in Indigenous Voices. The Menominee, Ho-Chunk, the Oneida, Stockbridge, and Brothertown, Interactions in the Removal Era. And that's in the 1820s and 1830s when the U.S. policy was to remove all Native people west of the Mississippi. That was their their um, purpose, what they were doing. Uh, next. Next, there you go. I've read many books on our history, always written by others. And sometimes they would quote a sentence or two from a, a Menominee chief or, a, or an Oneida chief and I'd always want to hear what else was said. And that's all I have is just a, a sentence or two. So I called myself a gatherer because I spent 10 years searching to hear those indigenous voices. I wanted to know or to hear the voices of our ancestors. Um, the Menominee and Ho-Chunk are indigenous to right here where, where we live. And we were from New York State, the Stockbridge in the the one I done the brother town and we we moved were removed here. And what did our people say to each other? That's what I wanted to know. And that was something I wasn't finding. So I really got into a lot of source documents and microfilm. And it's fun when I say that to younger kids, younger audiences, because they have no idea what I'm talking about. But older folks will know what microfilm and microfish is. And a lot of the uh, documents are recorded on there. So I did a, a lot of translating and uh, begging to find those documents. Next. Land, land is all about land. That's a quote from Loretta Matoxin. She was an Oneida historian who um, was an inspiration to me and to many other people in her research and her knowledge of our, of our history and, and she'd come in from meetings and she'd be very upset and that's what she would say land land it's always about the land and uh, so we would sit down and listen to her and tell us what she had experienced and what she was saying 
So Indian nation to Indian nation treaties were made in 1821, 1822, and 1825. And after that, all treaties were made with the United States. The major treaties from 1821 to 1838. In treaty after treaty, indigenous nations' lands were taken. It didn't matter whether it was an Indian nation to Indian nation or Indian nation to the United States. It was the land that was being taken. Next slide. The United States Constitution in Article 6, the second paragraph says, Constitution and the laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance thereof and all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land. And I often ask people, do you remember learning that when you were in grade school or high school? Was that ever stressed that treaties were a supreme law of the land or were treaties even discussed? And um, a lot of what people, the feedback I get from this presentation is people will say, why wasn't I taught that? And here it was, right? The Constitution hasn't changed. It was right there, but it was not something that we were taught. Next slide. In 1830, the Indian Removal Act was passed. And this, the goal of the United States government then was to remove all Indians from the east to beyond the Mississippi. So they would call that Indian territory beyond the Mississippi and the east side of the um, Mississippi would be for the settlers. But they had already started removing us, the Oneida Stockbridge and Brothertown from New York to Wisconsin in the 1820s. So we were, we were moving out here already before Jackson did the official 1830 Indian Removal Act. And even as we were here and we moved several times to be here, the United States continued trying to remove us. Once they got us here, then they wanted to move us in out to um, Missouri and Oklahoma and Kansas. So the removal poli policy continued. Next slide. This is a map that I, I never saw growing up or in all of my education, never saw this the indigenous lands in Wisconsin. And that's where our history of Wisconsin should begin. With a Chippewa way up to the north, um, the Sioux, the Lakota, they were way on the western edge of what we call Wisconsin now. The Menominee, the Winnebago, and down farther, uh, the Iowa and the Illinois. So that's when we talk about indigenous lands, that's what we're talking about. These are the homelands. Next slide. This is by 1860s, or no, the early 1800s. And you see the slanted lines there are, are the Ojibwe, the Chippewa. The lines going straight up and down to the right, that's the Menominee lands. The sections that are all in black, that's the Ho-Chunk and the Winnebago lands. In the white down, down towards where Milwaukee is, on each side of the Ho-Chunk lands or Potawatomi. And uh, to your left, the lines going parallel, that's where the um, the Sioux or the Lakota were. And they, they removed pretty, pretty early on. Next slide. This is what's left. These, <clears throat> these are the reservation lands in Wisconsin. And it looks like little postage stamps compared to having occupied the whole the whole area of land. And you can see the Oneida down here by Green Bay. And then you see the Stockbridge Muncie, which is in a corner of the Menominee lands, what was left. The Winnebago lands, you see little boxes. They're scattered about. And there's a whole story on how all of this happened. And then more to the north is Forest County's Potawatomi and Mole Lake, Lakota Ray, the Flambeau, Bad River, Red Cliff, St. Croix are all um, Ojibwe or Chippewa reservations today. 
So we went from all of the land to little postage stamps left. Next slide. This is a, a map that I found and I like to share it. There's a much better one though. Um, the reason I put this in is because there's a stereotype that um, they could that the U.S. could take our lands because they weren't well occupied. We were very scattered, and the evidence is much much different about where the villages were. And this gives you a look at above up going north of Green Bay, up by O'Connell, and you see Menominee villages going all the way up there. Then you go south of Green Bay, and you run into the, uh, there's still Menominee villages, but there's also Ho-Chunk, or um, they, they called them Winnebago in that time period, their villages. So it's kind of, when you get down towards Appleton, Appleton, a little shooting there, kind of a mixture of Menominee and um, Ho-Chunk villages. The one error in this map is where they have the Oneida, up north of Green Bay, we were never up over there. And, um, but they do have the Mohican down towards where Appleton would be. If you want, are really interested in this, and I found this so exciting to find all of these villages. At UW Stevens Point, they did a project with the uh, Menominee and you can put in Menominee creation story. You could type in on Google. And what comes up, you pick the site that Stevens Point. And on there, there's a creation story. There's a oh, fantastic thing on their clan structures, a lot of good information. And there's there's um, maps. So that's the Google site for Stevens Point. But there's so the good thing about that was that the Menominees, when they did this project, still knew the name in Menominee language of these villages. So they did all of, put that all in there. It just blows my mind to look at it. The other good one is um, called the Atlas of Great Lakes Indians by um, Tanner. And she, it's a lar larger size book. And if, if um, some libraries have it, you, have, you really have to ask for it sometimes and get it on interlibrary loan. But she did maps of, of uh, Indian villages all across the country. And she has these, and she shows, shows a lot more going north here with the Menominees and a lot more villages. So that's to take care of that idea that these lands weren't occupied, because they were. Next slide. In 1819... This agent, uh, his name was John Bauer, decided he would make a treaty with the Menominee. And uh, I found this in a um, missionary journal. So he made this treaty and it really took all, almost all of the Menominee land. And um, it, it greatly impacted because we were coming from the East and we got as far as Detroit, and we're told the lands were already sold by this this um, this agent. And the Menominee Statement, I was so glad to find this. Their response to that event says, we disapprove of what has been done by the agent and of the conduct of those of our nation who treated with him and sold our lands without our consent. They were informed that Mr. Williams, with a number of the chiefs of the Six Nations, were on their way to Green Bay to look out for a place of settlement for themselves and such others of their tribes as might be disposed to migrate, settle with them. Should they be pleased with the country, they were asked, will you sell or give them lands on which they may settle? Father, in regard to the delegates from the Six Nations, we Menominees have no enemies. We are ready to give them our hand, but in regard to a piece of land to give them, we know not what to say. Our territory is so small. Father, I listen always to what the white people say, 
but I do not want to do as some of our foolish people have done. I do not want to, to take on myself or to have those with me of the disp disposition to steal a piece of land. And he's alluding to the sale of the large tract of land by a mon minority of the nation, which they did with um, the, the Indian agent. But if all our nations were together, we would know what to do. And it's such a profound statement because it's sharing with us um, that the people who signed it with the, Colonel um, Agent Bauer and signed this treaty were not authorized to sell by their nation. They weren't authorized to sell or make treaties. And I find this throughout a lot of historical research. What happens is that these agents will come in and they'll find out from the chiefs who are authorized, they'll say, no, we're, we're not going to sell our land. So they'll go around them and they'll find other people and they'll get other people to sign who are, who are not authorized. And that's what happened with this treaty. Um, in some of the, re most of the researches that says that this 1819 treaty was lost to antiquity. Well, I found it. It's up in um, at UWGB in the archives in the um, Eliezer Williams paper. The actual treaty is there. Next statement. Next statement. Next slide. <clears throat> now the New York Indians were on their way here, and like I said, they got as far as Detroit, and then they were told that. Those lands were, so, were already sold. So this is what they said to this. Our great father, the president of the United States, gave to the six nations his consent that they should move to the West if they could obtain lands from their brothers there. We have been informed on good authority that the lands at Green Bay, which we hope to obtain, have been purchased by the great father's agent at that place. We shall expect that you, Father, and our great Father, the President of the United States, will remove these obstacles out of the way that your children may get quiet possession of the land which they have been encouraged to expect. Father, we wish peace. We wish to obtain a place to get our foot on peaceably and to live in friendship with our brothers in the West and our great Father, the President. Next slide. So what happened is they asked about, um, how do I put it? That 1819 treaty that Colonel Bauer did was not ratified. It did not go to Congress. And there, there were letters written to um, oppose it and say that was not a valid treaty. So that didn't happen. So then the New York Indians came back again in 1821. And a treaty was made at Green Bay with the Menominee and Winnebago and the New York Indians. That's how the um, US government clumped us all together as the New York Indians. And we're talking about the Oneida, the Stockbridge, the Brothertown. There were a few Tuscarora and uh, others with us at that point. And that was for a small piece of land down towards Little Shoot in Kakana, down in that area. In 1822, another treaty was made with the New York Indians and just with the Menominee. And that was because they thought the whole six nations, all of the Confederacy from New York State was going to move here. So they needed more land. And it was interesting to, to say why, why would the Menominee agree to that? And the only one thing I found was, um, in 1830, I found a, a little statement about that they understood that the New York Indians had had more experience with the United States government, and they thought that they would be could be a buffer there to help protect them. So that was kind of what was going on there. Um, and in 1825, the New York Indians, just the New York Indians, made a treaty with a brother town because they hadn't been part of those first two treaties. Now, Indian nation to Indian nation treaties were not subject to congressional approval. And President Monroe signed both the 1821 and 1822 treaty and stated that very clearly 
that it didn't require congressional approval. So this leads to a lot of um, controversy as we go along. Next slide. The Treaty of Green Bay between the Menominee and Winnebago Nations, and here they, now they're not saying New York Indians, they're listing here. The Brothertown, the Muncie, the Oneida, Stockbridge, and other New York Indians, August 18th, 1821. Next slide. At this point, usually what I do when I'm teaching a class is I'll give folks a, a blank map with just a few boundaries like Green Bay and uh, Kokona and where uh, Little Shoot. And then I asked them to the students to draw from this. This is what is in the 1821 treaty. I want you to draw where this is located. Beginning at the foot of the rapid of the Fox River, usually called the Grand Cacklin, then thence up said river to the rapids at Winnebago Lake. And from the river extending back in this width on each side to the northwest and to the northeast, equidistant with the lands claimed by the said Menominee and Winnebago Nation of Indians. There's just a, two, a few variables listing missing from that, from that in order to uh, really nail it down. Article 2 says the Menominees and Winnebagos shall reserve to themselves the right to occupy a necessary portion of the lands hereby ceded for the purpose of hunting and also the right of fishing. And that's Indian treaties just across the board usually have a clause in there about being reserving the right to hunt and fish in the ceded territories. Next slide. And um, the articles of the treaty on September 1822 lists who was there. So we're not lumped as the New York Indians. Again, um, the Mahicanook or Stockbridge, there were four people. The Oneida, First Christian Party, Oneida Nation, two. So there is, you've got to ask, why does the Oneida have a First Christian Party? And that was um, Eliezer Williams who had converted people he had converted became the Episcopal when they came here. Um, then there's the Second Christian Party and, or Orchard Party, which were the Methodists. And the third party was the Pagan Party or those who continued the traditional ways. So this division of our peoples into groups like this really impacted a lot with different treaties and over time. And it, the same thing happened with other nations too. Um, the Tuscarora Nation, there was one person, Eliezer Williams, to represent St. Regis, and St. Regis is the Mohawk people, and I never could find anything that really said they delegated him to do that. On um, the Muncie Nation, one representative, and the chiefs and headmen of the Menominee Nation of Indians, there are 10, ten um, representatives there. Next slide. In Article 2 of that 1822 treaty, it says, the Stockbridge, Oneida, Tuscarora, St. Regis, and Muncie nations aforesaid do promise and agree to, and with the said Menominees, that they, the said Menominees, shall have the free permission and privilege of occupying and residing upon the lands hereby ceded in common with them. And that's the key words that they're going to hold the land in common. This tract covered at least four or five million acres. Next slide. So now we have a controversy, a big one. Because the Menominee thought they signed a treaty to share land in common with the New York Indians. And remember, they weren't really saying those treaties were valid either because uh, the people who signed them weren't authorized to. And the New York Indians thought that they had purchased the land and they were told they were so going to come out here and purchase land. And the Indian nations, the Indian nation treaty signed by President Monroe in 1921 and 1822 
These Indian nation to Indian aid treaties were disputed throughout treaties from 1825 to 1838 because there's a, um, even though President Monroe signed them, there are like Secretary of War and different ones who, who refused to accept the validity of those treaties. So we have all kinds of controversy going on here. Next slide. In 1824, the Menominee's protested. They sent a memorial and petition saying that when the New York Indians, or Nottaways, that's what they called us, first came to this country, they asked the Menominees to sell them a small piece of their lands. That the Menominees replied to them, they had no land to sell, and that their country was already too small for their numbers, and that they were themselves compelled to hunt upon other Indians' lands. That notwithstanding this answer, the Nottaways held a treaty with some of the men of the Menominee Nation at which none of the principal chiefs attended and purchased or pretended to purchase a part of the Menominee's country, the boundaries of which they knew nothing about. Very strong statement. And throughout my research, I found each of the na Native nations presenting like this, saying very clearly where they stood and what had happened, and yet the treaties went ahead anyway. Next slide. Now we started with treaties with the United States. In 1825, the United States did a treaty with the Chippewa, the Sac and Fox, the Menominee, the Iowa, the Sioux, the Winnebago, and a portion of the Ottawa, Chippewa and Potawatomi. And they told them that this was to define their boundaries. Um, and they said they were going to stop war between these nations. And there wasn't a whole lot of evidence of this war, but I guess there were some. But they said the real reason behind it was to define boundaries so they'd know who to make treaties with. In the 1827, um, it says the representatives of the Menominees not being sufficient, sufficiently acquainted with their proper boundaries to settle the same definitively and some uncertainty existing in co consequence of the session made by the tribe upon the Fox River and Green Bay to the New York Indians. Therefore, they said the final decision on the land for the New York Indians was assigned to the president. And these two treaties, 1825 and 1827, were made without any input from the New York Indians. Next slide. The New York Indians said that the 1827 treaty at Butamore was an astonishment and a grievance because the same lands that, that they bought in 1821 and 1822 treaties were now being sold to the United States. This purchase of our lands was made not only without our consent and contrary to our most earnest wishes, but also without even consulting us at all. We were not allowed a hearing, nor even asked whether we would consent to sell or not. Next slide. In 1829, they wrote a lengthy petition on John Metox and Austin Quinney with Stockbridge and asked the um, president for a set that the second treaty of 1822, it says we purchased land, a large tract of land lying on both sides of the Fox River and Green Bay to be occupied in common with us. They have the right to settle thereon, whether it should be agreeable, not interfering with our settlements. And But how great our surprise and sorrow when at the late treaty held by Excellency Governor L. Cat, Governor L. and Lewis Cass, and Colonel Thomas McKinney at the Little Butamore in 1827, our lands were purchased by them as commissioners of the United States, and thus our hopes of security of this last refuge destroyed. So they're very clearly making their position known. Next slide. According to the 1827 treaty, 
the decision was left to the discretion of the president. He assigned three commissioners to meet in council with the Menominee, Winnebago, and New York Indians um, from August 24th to September 1st, 1830. John Quinney presented a sophisticated document outlining the New York Indians' legal understanding and claims and potential boundaries for New York Indians land were presented to the UN commissioners by both the Menominee and the Winnebago and the New York Indians and all the commissioners, and none of these were acceptable. And discussion just went back and forth and back and forth, but agreement was not reached. Next sign. In the presentation made by the Stockbridge by Quinney for the New York Indians, this thing is 32 pages long and it will blow your mind. You get a chance to read it. He provides three um, major sections in it. And he provides a sophisticated discussion on the doctrine of discovery and the precepts of Western civilization. Presumptive means supposed presumptions made about civilized and barbarous people. He asks if it is presumed that the New York Indians would leave their climate in New York State in exchange for an insecure abode in this inhospitable region. And he goes into asking whether if people don't have land and for anyone and their land's taken away, do they, um, and they're supposed to be civilized, do they revert to being barbarous peoples? They really challenge Western uh, civilization. Also, circumstantial reasons. Um, that one of, refers to the circumstances. Here it is with Menominee said that when a man, white man puts his fingers upon our lands, he has long nails and they go deep and it's hard to get them out. You have had sad experiences that this is true. You have told us the white people have got your lands and you have come to seek an asylum among us, for which we are glad that you thought of us. A tenancy in common was agreed upon between the parties. Very, very strongly that we're sharing this land, we're not selling it. Um, the other one is the documents uh, making treaties. Whose side were they valid? Uh, chiefs, were they appointed by the United States? Um, the French, the French people in Green Bay had quite a bit of interference in, in these treaties um, that they signed, the president signed and he disregarded this. New York, United States wanted the land. Like Loretta said, it's all about land. Next slide. In 1831 and 1832, because they couldn't reach any agreement with the three commissioners in 1830, um, the Menominee, they went right to Washington and then they write letters to the president. And in 1831 treaty, this is with the United States and the Menominee, 500,000 acres was identified for the New York Indians and the Menominee lose millions of acres of land. And those 500 acres are from Oconto and kind of Northern Wisconsin, that kind of that area. Uh, and the 1830 one treaty is the first time we see this designation. Uh, two townships for the Stockbridge and one township for the Brother Town. So even though they tried to lump us together as the New York Indians, it's very clear from these documents that we kept our separate identity as nations. And in my book, I put all those documents and who signed it. And you can see who they signed by nation. So it's, it's very fascinating. Um, the issue was real controversial. This didn't settle everything because the New York Indians are agricultural people and they wanted to exchange 200,000 acres on the northern side up by O'Connell down to um, for the southern side, which was much better for, for um, farming and agriculture. And an 1832 treaty was again made to, to settle a controversy and exchange the 200,000 acres and solidified the two townships for the Stockbridge and one township for the Brother Town. Next slide. Despite opposition 
the United States continues making treaties to remove the New York Indians farther to the West. They keep, there was a, a threat, um, just absolute threat that we're, you're going to get removed. Even though you're settled in one place, we're going to remove you again. So it was, it was a real um, a fear. Next slide. So in, for Oneida, in 1836, this agent who's Sudam made treaties with the Stockbridge and the Oneida for removal to the West. They were like boilerplate um, forms that you would fill out to apply for something. And they just changed the names of the tribe on there. And and um, I heard about these, I had to search for them, and they, ne they never were ratified or never presented, didn't go anywhere. In 1838, Buffalo Creek, United States Treaty, again, removal treaty. And they this was their plan to remove all of the six nations to the West. And what they did was each of the nations, like they told them the um that you will get so much land out in the West and we'll give you money to get there and we'll get we'll support you for your first year. And each of the nations, they went nation by nation to do that. And that was on January 15th in Buffalo Creek. And there's a lot of controversy about whether that was legal or not. And what, what um, one of the reports I read was they were sequestered and given a lot of alcohol and they keep on giving alcohol until they signed a treaty. I don't know if that's true or not, but that was one of the complaints about that treaty. So a couple of weeks later, on February 3rd, 1838, um, the Oneida Chiefs went to Washington, D.C., and made that was our final treaty. And in this treaty, they said they would allot 100 acres per person. And there were 654 Oneidas in Wisconsin. So our reservation here in Wisconsin, the final treaty, was for 65,400 acres. Next slide. You suppose the, any of this ended? No, it keeps on. This is a list of the Menominee treaties. And, and I put these up, and you can look these up anytime that you want. But I wanted you to see this went on. We talked about the beginning ones, 1831, 1832, 1836. Um, 1848, they want to remove the Menominee to Minnesota. And they said, well, let's go look at that land and see what it looks like and they came back and said no we don't like that land and they didn't move in 1854 um was their treaty with lands on along the wolf river beautiful wolf river 270,000 acres two years later two townships of that next little left hand corner there there was two townships designated for the stock bridge so this whole threat of removal continued and continued Next slide. The Stockbridge Treaties. Um, this could take another whole book just to go, go through this, but I wanted to list those and to see for you to see it year after year after year. In um, 1843, an act for the relief, relief of the Stockbridge tribe of Indians in the territory of Wisconsin allotted their land, changed the government to an elected system, made them citizens, and they were terminated, all in one act. And there was just immediate opposition to that. And, and three years later, that act was repealed. And they were restored to their ancient form of government with all the powers, rights, and privileges held and exercised by them under their customs and usages. But you had a division now. So 1848, you have the Indian Party and the Citizen Party, and they're still disagreeing about removal. In 1856, the lands east of the Lake Winnebago, they were to receive two townships of land near the southern border of the Menominee Reservation. That's when they, it happened. In 1934, um, their cover, the Indian Reorganization 
Indian Reorganization Act changed the government to elected system, and some lands were repurchased. But most of the land was was a lot during that time when they allotted them. The, the the government kept that those allotments, that whole process going. So it's a miracle. It's a miracle. It stayed together as people. Next slide. The whole chunk, the Winnebago treaties are some of the saddest ones I've ever read. They were the United States removed them and removed them and removed them even in winter and moved them over into um Minnesota and it's just it, it's another whole story by itself and you need to really look at these all these trees and look at it to understand it and we don't have time to go into them real thoroughly today but I just wanted to see that they they were removed um, to neutral ground west of the Mississippi, then to Minnesota, then to northeast Iowa, and then to Kansas. Next slide. This goes on, 1837. There's the Minnesota lands. And it's just heart-wrenching to look at the accounts of their removal. They were loaded onto wagons and to railroad carts, cars and removed. Another treaty in 1855, um, 1863, we were moved to Crow Creek, South Dakota. 1862, under the Homestead Act, they were able to um, get some pieces. When we looked at that map of current map of Wisconsin, you see the little little um, boxes there that were Ho Chunk land. That's what they got under 1862. In 18, 1963, their constitution was ratified again. In 1974, they won a million, 4.6 million through the Indian Claims Commission to compensate the tribe for its lands lost through fraudulent treaties. Next slide. The Brother Town Nation, they had the, were given the, um, assigned the two townships, two townships for the Stockbridge and one for the, um, Brother Town on the east side of Lake Winnebago. And again, they were threatened that they were going to get further removed to Kansas. And it looked like this wasn't going to end. They're going to get removed and removed. So their decision, what they decided was in order to stay together, they would become citizens of the United States. United States. And that ended their recognition as a nation by the United States. However, they continue to meet as the Brother Town Nation and have sought to be recognized by the United States for many, many years, and their battle continues yet to be erected, to be recognized. And the Mon Montauk that I am, that's one of those seven nations that's part of the of the Brother Town. And I've been to the Brother Brother Town Tribal Council meetings. Oh, it was fabulous. It was like sitting around the kitchen table with your grandparents and they're discussing and they're discussing and they say, well, that, this is what the issue and they talk and they talk. And then the chair would say, anyone come to a decision yet? And they put several ideas up and they discuss it and they discuss it. And I thought, oh, it's beautiful. So they still, still very much function. Next slide. Colonel Stambaugh, in that 1830 meeting, said, I believe the Menominee tribe of Indians have been most shamefully deceived, both by the agents of the New York Indians and by their own agents and advisors. I believe the New York Indians have been duped and deceived by their own agents. And I am sorry to say the government appears to have participated in the deception. And I think that sums it up of what happened through um, on both sides to the Menominee and Ho-Chunk and to the New York Indians. We were duped and deceived. And it didn't matter to the United States because they did whatever they did to get the land. That was their purpose. 
And with that, I'll wrap up and we can um, see if you have some questions. Thank you, Carol. Fascinating mm -hmm. uh, story. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so uh, I always say that uh, since I'm the moderator, I get to ask my questions first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you referred to the as the Beaver Creek Treaty for the Six Nations. Buffalo, were, Buffalo Creek Treaty. Yeah. What were the Six Nations? 1838. That's the whole Iroquois Confederacy. You would have heard of, learned about them in school either as the Six Nations or the Iroquois Confederacy. And that's the Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, Seneca, the Tuscarora. That's the Six Nations whose homelands were New York's, the whole of New York State. All right. Uh, let's see what we can see in the chat here. Oh, we don't have any questions yet. Oh, my goodness. Uh, there was one in the question and answer. Uh, where are some of the locations you sourced your information from? Oh, my goodness. Um, there's a book called uh, Kapler, Kapler's Indian Treaties, where he put together every treaty in the United States that was ever published with Indian people. So most of the treaties are in there. But the, the ones with... Um, Indian Nation to Indian Nation treaties were not there. And I found them maybe in a Indian agents report, in letters to the Secretary of Interior, in footnotes, in um, journals from different religious leaders who had traveled through, through these lands. Um, they're on microfilm. Um, there's just a whole ton of letters to the Secretary of War and, and um, Letters back from the Secretary of War. And for a couple of treaties, their journals were kept. And so that was a real source of information because they really um, captured the speeches. And that, that was just vital to, to, find, to find those. But um, there's only a few treaties where that, that happened. So I've been searching for a long, long time through many, many documents and microfilm. Um, at the Brown County Library, they have the the uh, and at UW archives, they have those letters to the Secretary of War, in their handwritten, they're on my, and they're copied onto microfilm, and then you have to try to read it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that's what it took ten ten years. It was it was quite a process, and sometimes yeah. you couldn't figure out a word. Just know how it could have figured it out. So you have to go through the whole rest of it, and maybe in context you might find. Might find some reason for might be what it is. Yeah, uh, both Donna and I are genealogists, and uh, the AI technology is advancing, so it can read some of the script handwriting. And I'm amazed oh, at yeah. the quality of it, uh, the translations. I mean, they're not perfect, and you can mm -hmm. see where they get some things wrong. And like you say, you have to connect it through context, but it mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, getting there. So. Yeah, I saw a question from, from Don about the Atlas of Great Lakes Indians. It is very detailed, extremely detailed. And it's a large book, like 11 by 17 or 20. It's a huge book. So it's not really easy to copy, but it's very, very detailed. I just um, advise anybody who's interested in those villages to look at that. Because it'll it's throughout the whole United States showing where the Indian villages were, and it just takes that stereotype of unoccupied land right out the window. Yeah, so there's the villages. Another thing too about a lot of the indigenous. I know it's that way with the Ojibwa. You know, they lived off the land, so you couldn't restrict mm -hmm. them to a very. You had to have room, you know, to fish and hunt. Yeah, and, yeah. and to grow crops. So yeah. Well, one of the things I, I do, especially with um with kids, is I take them, this is the room we're sitting in. So now you can imagine half of this is gone in one treaty. So we're squished over here. Another treaty takes another piece over here. 
another treaty takes more, another treaty takes this until we're in a little corner. And it kind of gives a little experiential sense of what that was like. I had a, a, a I think he was a fifth grade teacher once who he said he brought in big cardboard boxes, empty cardboard boxes into his classroom and just set them down. And he did it kept every day, bringing in more until finally a student asked, what are you doing? He said, each one of those boxes is a treaty that took your land. So all you have left is your little path here to get to your desk. So that gets your, your mind feeling more about what the reality of that. And the natural environment, um, we, we know, especially if you're involved in, with forestry, how much land it takes to have deer and bears. And uh, when you ruin that, that land, you, you're just like you ruined for us. And you can't feed your family. Yeah. So uh, Buck asked, where were these meetings held, the treaty meetings in the fields and buildings? Uh, uh, I know that some people traveled to D.C. or Washington. So yeah, that was a little some bit of more them. about where they actually met and negotiated. Well, well, if you think of Fort Howard here in Green Bay, mm -hmm. up around, around that area, sometimes they went to the villages and other times... Um, the Indian people would come in, and I remember one time the Menominee said, "We have to finish this treaty. It was fought. We have to get done because it's time for us to get the wild rice. And if we don't get home and get our wild rice done, but the commissioners didn't end it. They kept going, but they said a, a whole bunch of them left because they had to go home and do the wild rice. So it could be in the village, um, the Indian agent's house, Fort Howard." Um, there were places down towards Little Chute and Kakana that were meeting places that were kind of central for a, a number of tribes, and they would all come. Some of them were even called treaty meeting grounds by Prairie du Chien was, was one of those areas. I know you mentioned Butamore, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. so Butamore? A, a small area in the Fox Valley there. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Patrick asked, do you have any information regarding the Sioux and Menominee in Dunn County? Well, the only thing I kind of know is that that first map I showed where it showed the Sioux on the left-hand side of what well, is Wisconsin today. And um, th there's not a whole lot on it. They moved into the Dakotas. Yeah. They were just, uh, I didn't find much more than that. And like you said there, uh, you know, they moved out pretty early. And I know that the Sioux mm -hmm. also had a lot of conflict with the Ojibwa people. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in, in, in part because of all the displacement of, mm -hmm. of people in the eastern parts of the uh, United States uh, because of the I don't know what to call it, invasion of the Europeans. Mm -hmm. Well, and also, like we saw in some of the treaties, they didn't ask the people who were involved, and it was their land, they didn't even invite them to the treaty. They just made them, made the treaties. Yeah. I mean, you talked about yeah. this, and I know it, it takes a lot of discussion and talk to get uh, tribes to agree to things. It's not an easy thing, oh, but, it, no. <laughs> but it's also very, it's culturally very important to them uh, that everybody have a voice. You know what I mean? It's the ultimate yes. in democracy. So it takes a lot of discussion. Yeah. Well, one of the, the things that the, uh, the uh, U.S. did was with the Menominees, because we saw all those villages on the map. So the chiefs of all those villages had to come together to make these decisions. And the U.S. was tired of that. They didn't want to wait for that. And not only that, when they came to meet, they brought everybody with them. So then the U.S. had to feed all these people, too. And they didn't like that that either. But it was... Um, oh, I forget where it's going with that. What the U.S. did, because they didn't want to wait for the proper procedures to go through with native nations, they appointed people to be chiefs 
and said, you now you can sign a treaty. Oh, yeah. So they, they violated basic rules of another nation in order yeah. to get the land. Uh, so how were meetings announced? Uh, you know, as you know, mm -hmm. people were spread out and, you know, we yeah. didn't have email or telephones <laughs> or communication methods. Mm -hmm. It must no, have been but... difficult to let people know what mm -hmm. was going on. But we had these young men who were runners, and that yeah. was, they were assigned to go to the other villages in the other nations and invite them and tell them where the meeting was. So, and there's, there, there was one I really got a kick out of it because they were, ah, oh, they sent as soon as they got there, down by Kakana, down in that area, they sent the runners out right away. They sent these young men out to announce it until we will meet in seven days. So then in the meantime, they went to all of these, all the villages around there and interviewed people. So we ha have that documentation. Uh, so I'm going to uh, call on Don. We did a webinar about a year or year and a half ago. Um, and it was about the Ho-Chunk land agents or uh, agents. Uh, it's fascinating. You should look it up on our YouTube channel, folks. It's a really good story. Mm -hmm. And what goes into more detail of the Ho Chunk story and how they were uh, moved west and they were so tenacious, many, many oh. hundreds of them came back uh, mm -hmm. and to their homeland because they it, they were just not able to survive in the western climate. Don, you remember the name of I, that? I think one? you're talking about uh, Peter Schrake's talk on the Indian agent down yeah. at Portage. Correct. Indian yeah, so agent. look it up on our YouTube channel. Fascinating story mm -hmm. that's related okay. to uh, mm -hmm. what uh, you're talking about. Yeah, because that could be a whole book or two in itself, just yeah. looking at the, what happened to the, the Ho Chunk people. Yeah, they even, uh, you know, when they got to the Wisconsin border, when they were coming back after being mm -hmm. displaced, they yeah. bought white person's clothing. So they would look uh, mm -hmm. like white people and mm -hmm. often they would use that as a, a way to purchase land so they could stay. Mm -hmm. uh, fascinating story. And and mm -hmm. uh, the uh, presenter talks about it. He goes through mm -hmm. the diaries and the information from the uh, uh, Indian agents that negotiated a lot of this stuff in it. It's a fascinating mm -hmm. story. It's a good watch. It is. I see John the note. Piped in, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, John piped in uh, saying that Peter Schrake's talk was on the Stambo Treaty. Stambo Treaty, okay. And that, that's um, the one I ended with is the quote from him from 1830. Yeah. About all the misconception. You know, even though he understood what was going on, he did not want, he did not like the New York Indians at all. And that was very clear. He called us all kinds of names in there. You know, and I thought in this research that I was going to find a lot of fighting between our Indian nations, and I didn't. And we were pretty clear that we're getting manipulated and trying to stop the U.S. government in, in all of this. And just over and over and over Again, it, it happens in there. Miranda had a question yeah. for you. She said, mm -hmm. uh, where are some of the locations you sourced for your information? Can you Is there a quick rundown of places, easy places for people to access? Not so quite easy. a bibliography in my book. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot. Um, but those letters for, to um, the Indian agents, that's, I found that would lead, give me information and lead to other sources of information. And, and a lot of it is just footnotes. It's like in 1838, when they made the treaty with uh, Oneida for here, um, there's no boundaries listed. It just says 100 acres, 654 people. And I really thought that was odd. 
in here in the footnote to a fishing case trial, it says that there was a map that this aid, this prospector, Sudam, his name was, that he had done a map, rough map of what the reservation would look like and showed that to the chiefs. And that's why they signed the treaty. So I'd never heard that in all my years and my all my research. So so I had to go find that. So off to Newberry Library, and then I got hold of Chicago, and they sent me to a wonderful person in Washington, D.C., in the archives who found it for me. That map still exists, and we put it in the book. So it's, uh, a lot of finding things was like that, trails that you find. Uh, so if you're interested in the book, I think you can purchase mm -hmm. that through the university press or on Amazon or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But you can also come to the conference, and I'm so mm -hmm. somewhat optimistic that we'll have copies there, and you can get uh, the author to sign it. So I encourage people. I'd be to, glad to. <laughs> uh, another reason to come to our conference. I see uh, David Greeno, the historic preservation officer for the Menominee tribe, chimed mm -hmm. in. And oh, good. She, and uh, next week we'll get their perspective. Uh, but you know, they <laughs> they at least what I'm interpreting here, and it's it's not really a question, just a statement. The Menominee really didn't want to sell land uh to no, the New didn't. York tribes. They wanted the New York tribes to sit with them or I think to, to um you know live in a community with them. Yeah, to share. Uh, yeah. And it says in the treaty, in common, the holden land in common. That was what was understood. They were sharing. Yeah. So that's I didn't not how the United that. States interpreted. <laughs> yeah. Well, that and that's another part too, is that even though those treaties were Indian nation to Indian nation, there were the guys from Fort Howard, the officers from Fort Howard, and people from Green Bay who were witnesses to all of that. And they signed. They're, they're the ones who wrote it, wrote, physically wrote this stuff down. So it's, yeah, it's kind of like through their interpretation. You don't know that what was written down is what you said, what you meant. Um, so a uh, question here about any of these nation to nation treaties, if they had any effect on the bands in Canada, which were mostly Ojibwa or uh, Anishinaabe peoples. Uh, so I, I don't know if you know much about any nation-to-nation uh, -nation treaties up there. Well, what I do know in terms of Oneida is that New York State, I'm going to start back for The United States passed a, um, a law saying that only the Trade and Non-Intercourse Act, saying only the United States could make treaties with Indian nations. And New York State just, um, and you, you, hear, you hear it once in a while in news here, state rights versus federal rights. Well, New York State just blew them off. They made 27 illegal treaties with the Oneida that we took to the Supreme Court and won our case. But by 1840, our land base was down to 32 acres. That's all that was left in New York State because the whole bunch went to Canada. So there's a, a, a whole community, a whole nation of Oneidas in Canada. And there's a few in um, New York. And then we're the largest here. We have about 17,000 members. So that's what I know about the Canada connection there. I see a lot of, go ahead, John, Don. I didn't say anything, but but as long as you're giving me the, the floor, uh, Patrick mentions in a comment that if you're interested in maps uh, to Google mm -hmm. Rumsey collection maps, and you'll find a plethora of great maps. So oh, I Rumsey, love the maps. -E collection I maps. S E Y maps. Oh, I love maps. <laughs> they can tell us so much. Um, I'm, I'm not going to be able to say the name. It's a 
uh, Marinda uh, is a graduate student at UW-Madison in the Department of Anthropology, um, and she's a Menominee um, member. And she's just commenting about how your presentation really inspired her to keep pursuing her PhD. And oh, uh, thank you good. for writing the book. So. All right. That makes all that hard work worthwhile to hear that that others are inspired to continue and that it will continue. Thank her. Thank her. Did you say Dave had, Dave Greeno had um, chimed? Yeah, he just, like I said, he, his, his perspective was, or mentioned that the Menominee wanted the New York tribes to live in common and they didn't common. want yeah. to sell land. Uh, yeah. But I mean, I can imagine how complicated and difficult it was uh like you said millions of acres uh across the united states were seeded and uh, and just created a lot of havoc uh to keep things straight and like you said multiple treaties and and mm -hmm. then the whole effort to move everybody west of the mississippi yeah. and i know we'll be learning about that uh, in the both in the conference and and in David's presentation uh, mm -hmm. next week. So I'm looking forward to to hearing okay. Dave. Yeah. There was a co question from Ed Forster. Did the Menominee participate in the Indians Claim Commission, and if so, what did they get from that process? You know that? Oh, I really don't know. You'll have to ask Dave. I know the I know the Oneidas did. And they did they did um get an award from that Indian Claims Commission. That's the one in nineteen forty six. Um the Indian Claims Commission. So and we did some, but I don't know if the Menominee did or not. We have to ask Dave. Yep. Next week. Next week, yes. Or come to the conference. Yes. <laughs> I hate to keep uh beating the drum, but that's my job. <laughs> Okay, so we just got another comment. Um, and for some reason, I can't see it. Um, my Zoom is not responding, Tom, so. I'm glad you guys are handling all that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, how many New York Indians were involved uh, from Judy? You're talking about when we first first came. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, my computer glitched here. The program glitched, and so it might not be the yeah. complete question. Um, because if we started coming in groups after in 1823 is when we started moving out here, different groups, and um, like I said, the first Christian party were the Episcopals, and they settled on the north end of the reservation. The Methodist. Um, settled kind of in the middle, more south end of the reservation, and then to the west western part, the pagan party settled. Okay. So it was Do different groups that came. And the only number I really have is that in um, 1838, when we did our treaty, there were 654 Oneidas here. And they say that was half of our nation was here. Okay. Yeah, and she added to it now that when they first came, so so they were. Yeah. She was talking about in that eighteen twenty to thirty time period. Mm -hmm. And I, I imagine you know they just didn't have really good records, uh, and mm -hmm. uh, I think the only reason you got that six hundred and forty five is because they that was how they calculated how much land. Yeah, uh, how much land we would have yeah, so, when they counted us. Yeah, who knows how many originally came? I mean, it's pretty difficult. Well, and they, when they came in, in uh, you know, you had to walk or come by boat in those days. This was a long, long trip. So they came in with family groups yeah. and just keep, kept coming. All right. Well, this has been really a wonderful program. I really enjoyed it. Yes.
I'm mm -hmm. looking forward to getting my signed copy of your book on <laughs> okay. October 11th and meeting yeah. you in person. It was really a fascinating uh, story. Thank John, you. John, anything else? I agree Madonna? with you wholeheartedly. I can't wait to meet you in person at the conference. So Okay, I will be there. All right. We'll see you then. Thank you. All right, everyone, thank you for joining us tonight. Thanks. We really do appreciate having people join us and learn more about our Wisconsin Forest history. And thank you, Carol, for sharing your expertise with us tonight. It was a great conversation. Thank you. Yes, it was. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Bye-bye.